everyone. I'd just like to um, introduce you to our speaker today um, in the Project Here webcast series. My name is Simon Halliday. I am an assistant professor um, at Smith College and part of Project Here, and I'm looking forward to welcoming um, Suwazi Gilis Wang Sun, um, who is a PhD fellow at the United Nations University and an economist at the World Bank Group, who is today's speaker. Um, she is going to be speaking about promoting research transparency and reproducibility through capacity building trainings across Sub-Saharan Africa and Europe. Lessons learned and a way forward. Now, let me mention that um, Project Here is supported by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and we wouldn't be able to do this webcast series, the workshops, or um, a variety of the other work that we're able to do with Project Here without the support of the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. If you want to as well, you can follow our speaker, Elise, um, on um, Twitter at, at Wang Sun, and you can also follow Project Tier at, at Project underscore Tier um, on Twitter too. And you can find me as well if you feel like it at, at Simon D. Halliday on Twitter. We're all there promoting the work of transparency and reproducibility in um, the social sciences and sciences more broadly. Um, um, so as a of work, um, originally from Cameroon, she then um, pursued a degree in um, economic statistics and engineering at um, in Yuande, and um, then pursued her PhD at um, the United Nations University. She's followed that up with um, affiliations with um, the Berkeley Inst um, Institution for Transparency in the Social Sciences, um, so BITS, um, I always confuse the, the full um, acronym there, um, and has also worked with Project Here and um, Elise and I originally met both um, communicating in a workshop um, the importance of reproducibility and transparency in um, research through Project Here. So I'm looking forward to um, Elise's talk and I'm going to hand over the screen to her and I'm going to stop screen sharing for myself in a moment. Sure. Give me a second while... So I'm stopping sharing and I'm going to mute my screen and mute my microphone and Elise is going to share her screen. Um, welcome Elise, we're looking forward to your talk. Okay, thank you so much uh, Simon for the very good introduction. So as you said, so today I will be talking about uh, the outcome of the work that I started doing with the Berkeley Initiative for Transparency in Social Sciences since 2016 when I joined the network when I was still a second year PhD student. And I joined the network as a catalyst, and I will try and explain a little bit more what that means and what was the outcome of uh, my advocacy from the past four years. And uh, basically, I'll be talking about how the work that I've done through training across two regions in the world, mainly in Sub-Saharan Africa, where I'm originally from, and in Europe, where I studied for my PhD, what I've learned from uh, those capacity building training and what is the way forward. So for those of you who uh, haven't really heard about the organization, the Berkeley Initiative for Transparency in Social Sciences was uh, created in 2012 have, as part of the Center for Effective Global Action at UC Berkeley with the aim of building standards and openness uh, uh, related to integrity and transparency in social science researchers, in social sciences by identifying funds, developing tools and resources to strengthen the quality of research in social sciences and improve evidence for policy making. And one of the core pillar uh, of the strategy of, the, of BIT since it was created is to educate and catalyze and advocate transparency and openness uh, by training the next generation of social science researcher. And it is against this backdrop that I joined the network, as I said, in 2016. And I started training uh, across the world thanks to support uh, of BITS, but also uh, to other organizations such as TIRE, but also the Open Science Framework. So basically the training that I've done was focused on, I would say three regions, but today my talk will mainly focus on two regions, Sub-Saharan Africa, where I was lucky enough to give those trainings across all the different four regions of the continent. So in Central Africa, uh, where I give two trainings, transparency trainings in my home country, Cameroon, in West Africa, uh, thanks to the uh, generous uh, partnership that we built with OASIS, which is an NGO working on the Sahel in Niger. So we, we also did uh, those research transparency trainings um, in Niamey. 
but also in East Africa uh, as part of the East Africa uh, collaborative platform, uh, which is also managed by, by BITS and SIGA, the Center for Effective Global Action at UC Berkeley, and also in Southern Africa. So I managed to actually, based on those advocacy trainings, uh, to see what are the different point of converge, convergence or divergence in terms of how students, how early career researchers uh, perceive transparency, how they, they adopt it, and what is the impact of the training that I've been doing on, on the way they, 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 they really optic uh, transparency, openness, and reproducibility practices in their daily work. In Europe, where I study, um, I also uh, managed to do uh, some training in the United Kingdom, but in the Netherlands, where I study as well. So here, uh, I, I managed to train uh, at the London School of Economics uh, in the UK, uh, but also, as I said, in the Netherlands, uh, where I did my PhD. So basically, uh, as I said, given all those different uh, workshops that I organized, I managed to come up with some evidence, qualitative but also quantitative, on whether trainings or those advocacy, uh, those advocacy workshops really help in improving the uptake of transparency and reproducibility practices among different researchers. And also to come up with some lessons that organizations such as BITS, but also Tayer can use to better um, align the, the, the advocacy policy uh, over the next year. So I'm talking a lot about the training. What was the content of the training? So basically the training follow uh, exactly what BITS uh, has been doing uh, since his creation, which is uh, organizing two to three days where uh, on the first day, uh, the, the main content is focusing on uh, reminding the researchers about what are the ethos of scientific research by focusing on the 1942 Mentonian norms uh, the training really uh, teach the student about what is what should be considered as the norms of scientific research. So here, mainly it's about discussing uh, universalism, communality, organized skepticism, disinterestness, which I found, and I will really uh, discuss it a little bit deeper uh, in the, um, on my next slide, very interesting, especially in an African context where most of the students in the, in the research uh, following a doctoral degree usually are usually not doing it because they are passionate about it, but mainly because they are they cannot find an unemployment right after the master degree. So still in the first day of the training, I'm also uh, I also discuss uh, the reproducibility crisis uh, and discussing a little bit more about what are the threats to the transparency and reproducibility workflow. So talking about p hacking, publication bias non-reproducible work, workflow. So basically give an overview of the problems that uh, social scientists is currently facing. And then on the second day, usually what I talk to the students or the researchers are the solutions. So how can they overcome all those different problems by building pre-analysis plan, uh, pre-registration, pre sorry, or by building reproducibility, uh, reproducible workflow such as TAYE, which I use a lot especially uh, uh, with R, given that, as I will also mention it, uh, most of the students, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, where didn't have the license, the STATA license, to, to be able to follow most of the, the, the code or to apply uh, most of the code in, uh, in STATA. And then on the third day, I usually uh, discuss dynamic documents uh, on R, so how they can uh, build a reproducible, a reproducible workflow from the start by uh, directly writing the papers or the, the, the document in R and starting it from scratch, like using the code and then directly putting everything together to get the, the paper that they want. So these are some of the pictures of those trainings. And in terms of what was the composition of most of the team, so here I'm, I'll mostly focus on, on Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, in the uh, f in the first part, so basically, we, and without surprise, given that uh, in the application, I really mentioned that I wanted people to have a good quantitative background. So they were mostly men. Uh, or in the like when you look at the composition of the team, I had more male students than female students. Without surprise, and I have more people from economics, uh, followed by political science, psychology, and 
few people for marketing and management. So usually what I, what I did before starting the training, either in Cameroon or Niger or even in Europe, like the Netherlands or the UK, is that I started by having a little discussion about what is the expectation that they have on the training or whether they know anything about what is transparency, what is openness, and whether they've already used it in the past. And what I've realized is that in Sub-Saharan Africa, in most of the training in Sub-Saharan Africa, they really had no idea about what is reproducibility, what is transparency. They, they, they haven't heard that before. And, and especially the ethos, like talking about what are the scientific norms, even though they had some uh, lecture on research methodology, most of them didn't really know what, what they had, what, how research needs to be done. What are the different values? What are the different norms? So it was always, uh, it was always very interesting for me to hear about uh, what the students really think about uh, those norms and discussing it, whether it applied to their context. And I'll come back to that again during the recommendation on what I've really heard uh, from those students, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. And then in terms of the knowledge acquired, so as I said, uh, after, the, after talking about the, the norms and ethos of scientific research, I focus on the problem. So what are the characteristics of a research which is said to be unreliable or unethical? So when talking about p-hacking, publication bias, or irreproducible workflow, then I started getting like, they, they started recognize themselves in those practices. Like most of them, either in South Africa or in Niger or in Cameroon, they realized that they were doing p-hacking. They were, uh, you know, sometimes they had a paper that didn't give them any significant result and they put it in the file drawer or some of the paper cannot be reproduced. Like they, they didn't really get, uh, like have built any master do file or even save any codes to produce some of their paper. So there they recognized themselves and then they recognized that what they were doing was also not the way they were supposed to be, like it wasn't the way things were supposed to be done and that they were not in the right path. And that was also very interesting to listen to that. And as I said, this is only for the, uh, the this is only for Sub-Saharan Africa. And in terms of the concern, like usually before the training, as I said, during the very first section talking about the norms, they were raising a lot of institutional barriers that they are facing that might be a bottleneck for them to really adopt those transparency and reproducibility practices, even though it sounds interesting for them. For instance, they mentioned a lot of issues, as you can imagine, in terms of internet access on the campus, even access to those statistical analysis software such as data. They were also they've also raised the lack of a suitable higher educational body that are aware of the benefits of, you know, either open data or sharing the data or be transparent, like there's no incentive. But also the fact that at some point, when I was talking about publishing an open journal, they were mainly saying that they were adopting whether that would be beneficial for their career, given that they're already developing country researcher and they want to publish in top journal. That was mainly before the training, but during the training, I tried to emphasize that Talking openness is not just about publishing in open journal, but it's mainly about making sure that your workflow of statistical analysis is reproducible by other researchers. So uh, I was lucky enough that the first training that I've done in Cameroon was self-funded. And then uh, as I joined in 2016, so in 2017, I, uh, I run a survey where uh, most of the people that apply received the training in 2016. So one year after. So I had this idea of seeing, okay, because I had, like, let me get a sense on whether the student that I taught in 2016 in Cameroon have gotten something about transparency, whether they still remember what is a pre-analysis plan, whether they still remember all the different um, uh, element that I mentioned around uh, the necessity, for instance, of caring more about quality rather than quantity. So I run this survey and I had like 70 people applying and out of them, almost half have already received the training in 2016. So there I was able to assess at least what is the impact of the training that I did in 2016 in the one that applied in 2017 and that had received those, uh, the, the training that I did. And why I realized that the training that I did in 2016 do had, and like people that have had those, this training, uh, 
were more likely to be aware about open research practices. For instance, they were more likely to know about pre-analysis plan, p-hacking, at least they say they've heard about it, they know about it. Uh, this is very limited because I haven't asked them if they've, do, they've done it or if, whether they've applied for any research idea or any paper that they have at the moment. But at least I was happy to see that those people were mentioned that they heard about it as compared to the people that apply in 2017, but that haven't received the training in 2016. That's for Sub-Saharan Africa. Then when it comes to Europe, and as I mentioned, just uh, as a reminder, in Europe, I train in the Netherlands, but in the, in, the, in, the, in the UK. What I realize is that institutionally, there, there's just, there, there is already, like in, in most of the institutions, like in the Netherlands uh, or in the UK, there are already some knowledge about what is transparency, but they were mainly complaining about the fact that they don't have incentive that there's a lack of incentive for researchers to share the data. Like it was more about incentive for most of those researchers, including African researcher based in the diaspora. Because what I've shown or what I've discussed previously is for African researcher based on the continent. And individually, what I've received a lot has a feedback either in the Netherlands or in the UK is that they are still a little bit reluctant to adopt or to, sh to adopt transparency uh, practices such as, for instance, pre-analysis plan, pre-registration. There were a lot of uh, fear raised around the fact that they, they were a little bit reluctant to share the codes so that other researchers um, might get lazy, uh, like to encourage lazy researchers. That's the way they put it for most of the feedback that I had from those that were, uh, I mean, researchers in the UK or the Netherlands. That there is already like on the contrary and without any surprise than African researchers based in the continent, there's already some basic lineage about transparency, openness and reproducibility in the sense that they know that there are public registries for those study psychology, economics or political sciences. They know a little bit about how to organize their files. They know that there's a master do file, but when it comes to more advanced uh, practices such as dynamic document, for instance, then they were very keen to listen in the sense that now the training that I did in the UK or, or the Netherlands were mostly focused on those dynamic documents rather than going back again and showing them how to build a, like for instance, the, the tire protocol was more useful, especially the R version of the tire protocol was, was more useful for me in Africa rather than in Europe. And again, as I said, there were a lot of concern about whether by publishing their research idea uh, from the onset, they are not, they, I mean, the idea is not going to be still by other researchers or whether by sharing their code, uh, they are not encouraging other researchers that they say they might be lazy to do it by themselves. I tried to convince them, but there was always this use debate at the end of the training on the way to go about it. Now, I've asked myself again whether the training that I've done in Sub-Saharan Africa have had any impact on the knowledge and the adoption of the practices. And I mentioned this survey that I did in 2017 with people, with some of the people, part of the sample that have received the training in 2016 to see whether it has changed anything, at least in their knowledge of uh, things such as pre-analysis plan, the knowledge of publication bias, p-hacking, so on and so forth. So here I, I run a regression, and again, this is just, uh, these are very preliminary results and that are not in, intended to be seen as causal per se. I was just trying to play around the data and see really what's come out of that. And running a very first uh, multiple regression, what I found is that those that have received the training in 2016 as part of the people that I interviewed in 2017 have presented a higher probability of knowing or said, responded that they've heard about open research. There might be um, potential social desirability bias out of those responses. For instance, do you know what is p-hacking? Do you know what is a pre-analysis plan? Maybe because those people wanted to be in the, in, the, in, the, in the training at the end of the day. But at least I see a statistical significant difference in the sense that the training that I did in 2016 was, was most useful in you know, at least people know about, uh, people start knowing about transparency practices through the training that I did in 2016, and that lasts for a year. 
the same about whether they they should care more about quality than quantity, which was emphasized a lot in the training in 2016 when I was discussing ethos and norm of research transparency. And uh, that was a multiple regression. So I use a propensity score matching and an augmented inverted probability weighting regression. And the results are even better in the sense that I do find a statistical significant difference between the people that are trained in 2016 and the one that I, I haven't trained uh, using a mat I match based on uh, different characteristics like the gender, the age, the field of study, uh, but also uh, the whether they've the, the grade that they have at, at the graduate level. So whether they are they're in the first year or whether they are uh, final master students or whether they are already early career researchers. So all of all of that were used in the match in has matching variable. And again, here what I see is that people that have received the training in 2016 have a higher probability of knowing about pre-analysis plan, knowing about p-hacking, and more interestingly, they, they are actually, they, they are more willing to share their data and their code as compared to those that haven't received the training. This is only for Cameroon, and I will show how those very early findings are gonna be um, extended to the entire continent through a new project that we are gonna start, that we've already started, thanks to the support of the Social Science Research uh, Consortium, Kudesria. So overall, talking about Sub-Saharan Africa and taking the specific case of Cameroon where I was able to run this small survey, to, to put it that way, I would say that the training that I've done at least have improved the knowledge. It has leveraged the knowledge of researchers towards reproducibility, reproducible research and raised their awareness on common academic research misconduct. Again, I've, I've also uh, realized something, even though the number of women that I survey were very less, I explained again in, at the beginning, the people that uh, have more interest on those on those trainings are usually those that have a very good background in quantitative research uh, or statistics. So it's very, it's, it's quite normal to see a very low number of women uh, having an interest on such issues. But basically, I found that, and I can come, I can go back to the econometric table that women are less likely to engage into non-transparent behavior as compared to the mid piece. And that gives very interesting insight into where specifically, if we want to spearhead the research transparency movement in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, should we more focus on women or men, or should we put more stress on women as compared to men? So I also find interesting to have found this gender bias on the impact of my trainings on the students that, uh, that were part of my sample. And again here, so this is what I'm saying, that the policy that aim to strengthen research possibility should focus more on men and use women as catalysts for the openness movement, given that they are more uh, likely to adopt TOR practices. So overall, apart from those, uh, apart like, if I'm only looking about the training, it's, it's a little bit difficult to conclude that there is an impact, given that during the focus group discussion, before or after the training, there were a lot of institutional barriers that were raised by the students. So first of all, uh, there, there, was, there was this concern about the high prevalence of predatory journals uh, in academic institutions in Sub-Saharan Africa, in the sense that quality seems to be not so much value in the academic environment in Sub-Saharan Africa as compared to quantity. So you will see a lot of people that are publishing in predatory journal, but that are getting promotion as compared to people that are trying to, you know, adopt transparent practices, but are still are publishing in quality journal, but they don't have so, so much publication. So the, this issue was raised a lot during most of the training that I've done across the continent. So across the four different regions, either in Eastern Africa, Southern Africa, Central Africa, or Western Africa, that I thought, is for me something that should be think about probably in the training, try to put something, and I will come back into that, like having a research methodology training where students are 
uh, trained on the different journals, what is the predatory journal, where, sh where should they publish across the discipline, how can they recognize what, what is the peer review journal and what is the like a, a quality uh, a, a predatory journals, uh, just, just to say. And then again, uh, backing this point that I just mentioned about the high prevalence of predatory journals, there were also, um, again, this trade-off between quantity and quality always come back in the sense that it was, it, it always come back to me from the student that I've trained that Productivity is seen as someone having a lot of publication rather than someone having two, three publications in top journals. In, a, in an African context, what really drives promotion? Uh, in the country that where, where I've done the trainings, are more, it's more about having publication, not necessarily in top journals. And that can be somehow um, a barrier for transparency practices to really be uptake in that environment where quality is not necessarily valued by higher academic institutions deciding about the promotion. Uh, again, it was always interesting for me to, dis to, to delve into, dis into the discussion about the Metonian norms, talking about communality, talking about disinterestness, which I found very interesting because as, as I mentioned, most of the people that you will find in doctoral degree in in an, in in, Af in sub saharan africa usually they doesn't they they really don't end up in that path because they were dri driven by you know this interest uh, of advancing science most of the time it's because they can't find an employment right after the master degree and then they ended up doing research and there was there were a lot of debate about disinterestness uh has metonian norms and they were very uh, they were, I mean, were, I found it very insightful and they also find it very insightful to know that they shouldn't do research because of money or because they believe that having a PhD or getting those publications will give them more money, but just because they want to advance science. And that was something very interesting um, in all the different trainings and across all the different regions where I trained. The disinterestness was a norm that where students really had a very keen interest on. And then always this top-down approach in the sense that in, the, in, in higher academic institution in Sub-Saharan Africa, the, the professors or the supervisor has the power, has a lot of power. Like he's the one deciding on the type of methodology that the student should adopt when he's pursuing research. So if he's not really aware of TOR practices, TOR here for transparency, openness, and reproducibility practices, it might be difficult for the students, even if he's willing to, to practice or to adopt that in, in his daily basis, either, either by adopting pre analysis plan. I've heard most of the students that I, especially in, in Niger, um, that most of the supervisor doesn't even want the student to share what is the research methodology to other PhD students because they don't want the, the other people to know what they are doing like as part of the project. So there's still this culture uh, very hierarchical culture in Sub-Saharan Africa that might be an impediment for TOR practices to really be uptake uh, in, across different institutions. So a bottom, uh, instead of going with a bottom-up approach by training the next generation, it might also be interesting for organizations such as BIT to think about doing trainings um, targeting senior researchers, and that can be easily done by partnering with organizations such as the African Economic Research Consortium, which is based in Nairobi. Uh, it's the, the East uh, Initiative can easily partner with them to see how uh, we can really change the norms that are ongoing in Sub-Saharan Africa and how they can, those senior researchers can understand the value of research transparency and, uh, and, and then encouraging their own students to, to adopt that. Uh, another lesson that I learned from my training in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, mainly again related to the institutional context, is that there is a huge untapped potential of among quantitative researchers based in Sub-Saharan Africa. In the sense that, for instance, uh, I remember when I went to Niamey and I had a class of almost 40 students, and then most of them never heard about STATA before. 
uh, most of them haven't really used the software before because the the university is not it, it doesn't have enough money to buy Stata, for instance, which was very useful for our training. And I and lucky for me, I had a a, a free copy of Stata that I distributed, and most of them ne really never heard about that. But they were really able to practice all the different sessions that we had very easily. in the sense that they were able to code by themselves. And I, I was very amazed by this ability to learn very fast in the resource limited and deprived environment. And I thought it was it's something that um, probably be should consider. And by considering what I mean here is that given that data is expensive and we have the, the opportunity, uh, thanks to the work that Taya is doing to train the student in programming in R, which is a, an alternative software of Stata doing almost the same thing, even better. Then I'm suggesting to really, when it comes to RT2 training, research transparency training in Sub-Saharan Africa, to shift the focus a little bit more on R rather than Stata. Because with Stata, and I will mention it, the sustainability of the impact of those training might be disrupted or might not be uh, what is expected in the sense that the student have this free copy, they use it for a month or for two, and then they started asking me back again as a trainer whether they can have another copy and I can give them. And even though they are willing to, to continue working, they are willing to continue using the master do file, they can. So I would suggest here as a recommendation is that, as a strong recommendation is to really uh, try to put the focus a little bit more on R, on training on R, and avoid Stata as much as possible because they learn, but they, it, it won't sustain in the future because they won't have access to the software. And the Tire 2.0, 3.0 protocol is having a Stata section and an R section, and the R section can be a little bit more developed with other catalysts with, uh, of bits to really make it more di digestible for researchers based in Africa. And then we can then start from scratch and then teach them, even from the undergraduate level, how to use R so that by the time they reach, uh, for those who want to continue to research, the PhD level, they're already very well um, aware of the software. Like they, they have very good skill on the software that they can apply uh, later on. Again, uh, another lesson or recommendation that I would give is that as I was already mentioned about, um, I was already mentioning about uh, predatory journals, uh, the, high, the high prevalence in the sub -Saharan, Af the sub saharan Africa academic context is that I had a lot of demands across how to write a publishable research article. There was an increased demand. Most of those people, they don't even know how to write a proper article. Most of the students that I train in Sub-Saharan Africa across the different region. So there was this demand about, can we have a research methodology uh, lecture at the end of the training? So we know how we should do the thing, like how should we start? What should we put in an, in an introduction? What should we put in, 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 the, in, the, in the text? Like what, what, how should we write things in such a way that we increase our chances to publish in good, in good journals? So again, one of the recommendations that I would say here is that probably there should be in the packages of training that are dedicated for Sub-Saharan Africa of research transparency training, there should be a specific, um, I would say it, it can be something written in advance that should be shared with those researchers so they know how they can frame an article in such a way that it's publishable on top of adopting those transparency practices, writing a pre-analysis plan or having a master do file and so on and so forth. And uh, as I was already mentioned, use women as catalysts to spearhead the research transparency movement across the continents, given the evidence that I found, which you know, we, will still, we will try to confirm in further research by extending, because this is only valid for Cameroon, but whether there's really a gender bias in the adoption of transparency practices. Are women researchers more or less likely to adopt transparency and openness practices as compared to their male counterparts? So this is something that probably bits should think about. First of all, by hiring more, by ensuring that there is a gender balance when um, 
applying, like when making the selection for the training for the summer institute that they're organizing yearly, but at the same time, hiring more women catalysts. This is something that is useful, <clears throat> given that they are more likely to, to, be, uh, to adopt uh, TOR practices as their male counterpart. So how, what about Europe? Again here, uh, have, has, I mean, what I've observed is that research transparency norms and rules are already in place in most academic institutions. Like they know about it, they know how they should, they should structure their file, they know a little bit more about, as compared to sub and African-based researchers, about publication bias, they know about unethical research practices, but they are not necessarily enforced and widely adopted by the academic communities. But over the past two to three years, there was an increased recognition of the importance of research transparency in, in European academic institutions, especially in the Netherlands, where most university, uh, in most universities, there's now a requirement of students to share their data, their raw data of the master, uh, either the, the master science thesis or the PhD thesis for reproducibility purpose. So this is something um, that, you know, I mean, after the training, uh, with the, based on the exchanges and the discussion that I had with participants based in Europe, is that it's more at the institutional level. Some of the researchers are willing to fully embrace TOR practices in their daily research routine, but there are still some institutional bottlenecks that are preventing them to do so. For instance, there's lack of rewards of, uh, of researchers, of early adopters, uh, of early European academic adopters of those practices. And at the same time, and as I, as I was also mentioned, there's still this reluctancy about uh, pre-analysis plan, uh, pre-registration of the research, uh, whether the research won't be stolen by their peers, whether the fact that sharing the data will encourage other, research, other lazy researchers to not do their job properly. So this debate always came back in the European context that I haven't really seen a mo much in Sub-Saharan Africa, probably because they, 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 it, was very, it was the very first time for them to hear about it as compared to, European, uh, to the European context, at least in the case of UK and the Netherlands, where uh, the, those issues always came back during and after the training. So for Europe, basically, the different um, advice that I got from most of the participants that I train is that they first of all, there should be more advocacy training. There are not that much in the European context. So I was the very first to do that in the Netherlands. And I think some of my colleagues took up afterwards. So I give a lecture in, in my university in Maastricht. And then I think there was, at some point I heard that they, they were planning to do that every year for at least the master's student in public policy. The second um, advice that I got for researchers based in Europe is that there should be more training for the younger generation. So here the bottom up approach really works because of the hierarchical um, uh, structure between supervisor and students that are quite different in the European context as compared to the African context, where it's difficult for a young African researcher to really go against what the supervisor want him to do, uh, right? Whereas there's still the possibility, there's still a scope for a young European academic researcher, or even an African researcher based in the diaspora to convince the, uh, the, 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 the professor that probably it's worth uh, right, is worth pre-registering our research or is worth having a pre-analysis plan or is worth uh, sharing our code or sharing our data for other people to reproduce. So here I would say having more training in, in, in an European context and I think BIT is doing it already. Uh, the RT2 has been uh, delocalized very recently. I think two years ago they were in the Netherlands to do the training. So this is good and such initiatives should be encouraged so that we have more uh, trainings done in European context, if we really want them as well to follow the the, RT, the research transparency and openness movement. And then another um, uh, advice that I got from most of the participants is that they should foster partnership between higher institutions that have already adopted, to, that are a little bit more advanced with those lagging behind. For instance, if the University of Maastricht is already advanced 
uh, in adopting research transparency practices. They should probably partner with Leiden University or another university in the country, which is still lagging behind, so people should learn more about the experience. Or say, if the University of Maastricht, for instance, is already requiring their students to publish their raw data so other, and then store, store it in the library, then other researchers or other universities can learn from that experience on how it works, which is lacking. So in fostering the partnership between institutions, uh, between those lagging behind and those that are early adopters is something that come up from the participant of the training in Europe. And then another advice or another lesson that I learned from Europe is that, again, th there should be more partnership between uh, foreign institutions like SPAC or BITS or Tayer and higher academic institution in Europe, like uh, the, the BITS initiative, uh, none of the researchers, at least at the time where I trained in the UK and the Netherlands have heard about it before. So probably, uh, you know, I know BITS is working with um, most, like some, BITS has some partners, universities across Europe, but probably they should be increased. If we really want the impact of those advocacy training to be felt, you know, beyond the US. And then uh, the, the, the issue of incentive always came, came out as well in Europe a lot, where, uh, for instance, some of the, there, there were people in the room that were saying, yes, I'm sharing my code, I'm sharing my data, but I got no incentive because uh, I'm, I'm getting no incentive to continue in that path because I, my institution is not encouraging me. So create, creating specific reward for researchers that are early adopters of transparency, openness, and reproducibility practices based in Europe is something that should be done for uh, uh, transparency and reproducibility to be uh, really entrenched in the norm of uh, academics based in Europe or African researchers based in, in Europe. So now what is the way forward? I was talking a lot about um, the fact that what we got has result from the survey that we did in Cameroon with the researcher that received the training in 2016 and, and, and those that haven't. It is very preliminary um, as a result. It's only focusing on Cameroon and the sample is not representative, so there's no external validity per se. We were lucky that uh, we recently, uh, me and a couple of my colleagues that I will mention uh, in, the, in the next couple of minutes, receive a grant of 30,000 USD. Uh, the organization is the Social Science Research Council in Africa called CODESRIA. And, and the goal is that we want to understand how African researchers perceive transparency, openness, uh, and reproducible risk practices. And, empirically identify and come up with a causal identification on what, which type of training works to foster transparency among African researchers. Uh, we will also focus on, unfortunately, we won't be able to include European researchers as part of this research, but we are thinking of including African researchers based in the diaspora to, to make the comparison. So basically the idea here is that we, we are planning to run an online survey and an experiments in the in each of our country of origin. Uh, we are we are a team of six researchers. So there's Ama Panim, Kachana, Bukiatu, and Jane um, from Burkina Faso. So we will be doing the training and the experiment. I mean the online survey, and but the experiment will be done in Burkina Faso, in Cameroon, in Zambia, Uganda, and Ghana. And the the first research question that we aim to answer as part of this. Uh, research grant is first of all to understand what does transparency, openness, and reproducibility mean for quantitative African social scientists, right? Like we've been, I've been doing those advocacy training. I've been coming up with the Metonia norm. I've been training them on transparency, but we really still don't know much about how do they really see it themselves. Like, what does that mean for them? And whether that differs across career stage, across location, across uh, whether they are based in Africa or whether they are African based in the diaspora or across discipline, right? This is something that we will aim to answer through the online survey that we'll be running. And then again, we, we still don't know much about which specific TOR practices are already embedded in the workflow of quantitative African researchers. For instance, we don't know 
whether uh, some of them are already using, wh whether it's pre-analysis plan, which is, which is already used much, whether they're already avoiding as much as possible p-hacking, whether some of them are already using specific form of software, maybe e-views or are, whether they've already uh, having this sense of building a reproducible workflow. So these are things that we don't know and that we would like to learn more uh, by focusing on this multi-country study um, to have an insight of what, what, which TOR practices are already embedded in the workflow of, of researchers based in Africa and those in the diaspora. And then the third goal of this online survey before I move into the, the experiment which will try and unravel uh, how, uh, tr how, whether training works to improve the uptake of transparency, openness, and visibility in, in Africa, is that we will, we will try to understand what are the barriers, right? I've been talking a lot about institutional barrier. I've been talking a lot about the lack of resources, the lack of uh, software at the institutional level. So whether, so, so here the idea will be to understand whether awareness is an impediment, whether awareness is a barrier uh, about, it, it's a barrier for African researchers to adopt transparency. And what is like, what is really, uh, where can we really act? Exactly. Like if it is knowledge, which is a barrier or whether it's, which type of resources are really lacking and that really impede African researchers to adopt transparency and reproducibility practices. And the second step would be to do a field experiment. So as part of the field experiment, what we are thinking of doing is uh, having the training randomized uh, across participants. So some of them will be selected for the training. The training will be following uh, for each of those countries, the, the, the format of what BITS has been doing over the RT2 or what we have been doing as a catalyst. So having those, uh, talking about the different ethos of scientific research and then talking about unethical research practices, the solution, dynamic document, the tie up protocol, and mentioning about initiative. But then what the innovation here is that instead of having just one treatment arm in the training, we thought of having uh, two treatment arms. So we will be first, the training will be focusing on two strands. So the first is that We'll be having a section where uh, some of one group of people that will be trained will receive um, like a, will, will be uh, they will be entitled to a specific module where they will be talking about what is the motive like the the philosophical ground around transparency and reproducibility like talking them about the fact that this is the way to go because this is the norms, uh, this is how things need to be done, uh, right? Like it's important to follow transparency, openness, or to adopt those methods because uh, since 1942, we need to follow those norms and then there's a reproducibility crisis. Like really the treatment here, will, the, the treatment arm here will mostly be about motivation around the philosophy of transparency itself. Whereas the other group will be having a training or a sub training or a module or sub module where it's going to be more about the motivation around their career. Like they should adopt transparency because uh, this is good for their career because more and more international journal are, uh, is, is mandatory to share your code, is mandatory to share your data and then see how this will impact on the, on the adoption of transparency and openness and, and reproducibility method around African researchers. So that's the next step. And we've already started from January, uh, you know, designing the, the, some of the survey instruments and we are still looking forward to receive probably more support in terms of funding. So far we only have 30,000K, uh, $30,000, sorry. But we are expecting to get more insight on what really works, on whether training really works and which specific type of training really works. And on top of that, understand uh, how African researchers, either those that are based in the continent or that are based in the diaspora, perceive or define transparency. 
in their own context and what are the barriers so we can better shape or um, you know design advocacy workshop that suits their context and their interests uh, i think i will stop there uh, i think these are just the hypotheses that we are making uh, based on what we've already um, we've already found that transparency increased awareness this is what i found as part of my research at least the one in cameroon transparency uh, trainings in increase adoption of those practices and that we are assuming that whether you are receiving a training where the focus in the, the, the philosophical grounds around transparency or whether you receive the training based on the motivation around your career that this is important for your career it's important for you to move on then you should go for analysis plan you should go for uh, you know organizing or having a reproducible workflow so we believe that this will make a difference uh, among the way African researchers or researchers, I, I want African researchers, so those based in the continent or those based in the diaspora, adopt those practices. So thank you for your attention and I look forward to any questions or clarifications uh, around what I've done uh, as a presentation. And I'll finish with this very nice roadmap that I've used over the past year throughout the training uh, to convey the message and spearhead the movement. I look forward to continue working on this very exciting agenda, which is useful for all researchers, not just African researcher or European researcher, but even here in the US. Uh, yeah, thank you for your attention. Um, so firstly, I'd like to say thank you so much to Elise for what she's managed to do here. Um, uh, some fantastic insights there into what is going on in Sub-Saharan Africa and in the participation in, um, in training um, the next generation of, of researchers in Sub-Saharan Africa and transparency and reproducibility. Um, and let me just say as well, like having done some training myself of this at the University of Cape Town, with colleagues there, I'm originally from South Africa, um, that um, graduate students at the University of Cape Town and from um, around the, the continent who participate in the PhD program there, they see phenomenal um, importance in this um, aspect of improving um, reproducibility and transparency in their own research and adopting those practices, also identifying some kind of comparative advantage for them later too. Um, so I'm going to um, address two questions that came up. The first one, um, and if I was going to ask a similar question, was um, so what if we approached the state of corporation and asked if they would be willing to make status software available to researchers in low-income countries for free or a nominal cost, for example, $20 US or less. Since almost no one in low-income countries is using Stata, this would displace very little, if any, commercial purchase of Stata. Maybe it would be good PR for Stata and provide a valuable resource to researchers in low, um, um, LDCs. On the other hand, maybe that is totally misguided. Maybe we should just forget about commercial packages and promote the use of our and other open source software. Um, they proposed this mostly as a thought experiment, but who knows, maybe something like this could fly. Now, um, I just wanna add some additional detail there. So um, I, I teach with both R and Stata and um, something that Stata has very been very kind to do recently is as a consequence of the no novel coronavirus, they've made their packages free of, um, available free of charge to our students um, and to a variety of students in across the world as a consequence of the novel coronavirus, because those students will typically access Stata in um, in the lab, I'm sorry, in the lab on their own campuses that they can no longer access. So um, I don't think this kind of thing is entirely off the table, but um, yeah, maybe you have some insights into like, should we totally abandon Stata if they pr promoted something like that? Or do you think that that kind of idea might, might fly if we could um, uh, promote it? Or yeah. as um, the, the viewer said, maybe they should just abandon Stata and do R as you're proposing. Yeah, probably I can jump into that uh, question already. So probably I would say I wasn't aware of the recent initiative that Stata has on making most of those packages freely available, but I think that's great because one of the problem with R, as you know, is that it's, it's more programming oriented where you can't really click 
click and go and have the results. And even though it has been promoted in most of the context in Sub-Saharan Africa because it's, because it's free and open source, students still are still struggling uh, to, you know, have it as a statistical, so a primary statistical software by default. So it would be great, maybe that probably Stata um, had, you know, I know they have already had some specific packages directed to African researcher. I guess if you're based in Africa, you're not paying the same than uh, whether you, uh, you're based in the US or abroad, but at least I was thinking just have it free for them. But given that, since, since that this is a little bit difficult, I was just thinking that we should directly switch to R and then start putting more emphasis on teaching those students how to program uh, with the software, probably starting at the undergraduate level. We are lucky enough that we have a uh, very useful source of information done by Tire. The Tire protocol is there to guide them through the different steps, how to import a data set from Excel into R, how to analyze the data and I even have more packages that are sometimes even more powerful than, I mean, I don't want to do, uh, <laughs> you know, to advertise R more, but I believe that uh, R is a way to go. So at least in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we can already leapfrog in terms of jumping directly into those transparency and reproducibility purpose. And it, also, it will also ensure the sustainability of the of the training and the advocacy workshop that I've been doing in the past, that we've been doing in the past uh, with other bits catalysts, in the sense that, as I said, most of the students after two to three months, they want to continue working, they want to say publish a research paper, but they can because their state alliances has expired. And sometimes I was unable to act. So I think um, we should already start early by promoting our, uh, you know, making at least sure that they they can continue working and they can continue applying what they've learned throughout the training even months or year after the end of the training yeah, yeah and, and so one of the examples that i actually find useful for the, with that is that one of the problems that i've had is when students graduate and no longer have access to stata but we still want to collaborate on a paper yeah. whereas with r that wouldn't be a problem yeah um and the, so a second question here is, are there any plans to do retraining of some of the more senior researchers um, where these senior researchers seem to be um, identified as part of the problem? Um, so far, I really haven't had. So I think it's something that we've been thinking. I've been discussing that with uh, the administration at BITS to organize like a senior policy workshop uh, in partnership with the African Research Consortium or the African Academic of Science, where we can convey uh, senior researchers, uh, you know, just to discuss a little bit, discuss about transparency. But some, this is something that haven't been planned, but I'll, I'll probably reach out to BITS again to see to what extent this can be done, because I think it's very important, because I got that a lot in the different contexts where I train. As I said, I was lucky to train in West Africa, in Central Africa, Southern Africa, and the same issue come up. Like my supervisor probably won't, won't want me to share our data, or my supervisor won't want me to pre-register uh, our research idea into AEA RCT registry. What should I do? So this is something that always come up, and I think it's very important to go for this uh, top-down approach. It's, it's good to train the next generation, but if they can't really do anything when it comes to uh, um, convincing their advisor, their senior advisor, that this is the way to go, I think it's a little bit of a problem. So uh, I would say there's no plan, but this is probably something that we can include as part of the research that we'll be doing with the CODESRIA grant that I mentioned uh, as part of the way forward where uh, given that we'll be partnering with the African Economic Research Consortium, which is the leading, which one of the leading think tank of economist research in the continent, we can think of convening them for a workshop. But this, yeah, this is something that I will, I will uh, suggest to my colleague who are working in the project with me. So given your discussion there about the AERC, the African Economic Research Consortium, what role are you seeing for it perhaps maybe to help coordinate say local statistical agencies um, and also maybe um, like some of the, the flagship higher education institutions in sub-Saharan Africa. So for example, I know that you've, the, there's the collaborative PhD um, that the ARC is involved in and um, 
there's also at the same time as that's happening on one side, I also worry a lot about data quality and underfunding of statistical agencies on the other side. Because as you know, in many sub-Saharan African countries, you've got their, their researchers and people who want to have like very good quality data, but it's, it's, there's cash strapped statistical agencies which are trying to work out whether they want to continue collecting data because it costs so much money. Um, and so I, I, I kind of wonder here a little bit about um, those specific constraints about sub-Saharan Africa, but then also maybe some opportunities for collaboration like you're suggesting from the ARC or other higher educational institutions in um, yeah. South Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa. So maybe you have some comments on like other paths for collaboration, but also recognizing some of these constraints. Yeah, definitely. I think the ARC has the ability at least because given that they are bringing in uh, researchers uh, from different universities, and they are, they are really like from, I mean, they, they have the possibility to uh, say, do an advocacy to probably like say the, the dean in the university that they are partnering with and they are partnering with most universities across the continent. As I said, it's one of the biggest think tanks. So we see that at least in, in terms of policy, they can influence uh, those dean in the importance that probably the professor there are aware that this is going to be the next norms, I would say, that this is going to be uh, like for, for say, like to incentivize or to incentivize their, their staff in the importance of their student to adopt transparency and openness and reproducibility movement. And they can even partner with the African Academy of Science who is doing a great job in promoting and advancing science across the continent and who is also recognizing the importance of transparency and openness and visibility in, in, in social science. So I think this is something that uh, we've, I guess I would suggest that again to my colleague, uh, we can think of probably during the training that we'll be organizing in the different country, because they are one of our counterparts as part of the study to convene the senior policy and they, they have it already each year, they organize senior policy research uh, workshop and this can be the opportunity to discuss that and to see to what extent we can bring in uh, uh, dean of the different university partnering with the AERC and discuss the importance of that and even to introduce that into manual at the undergraduate level. Yeah, this is how we we, we see the the help that a, the AERC can have in in fostering the the movement. Okay, so I'm going to take a, the final question from Maxim Kondiwa. Um, and so uh, the comment here is that um, several African scholars like um, Mahmoud Mamdani and Tandikam Kandawira, who recently passed away, yeah. um, have point, um, pointed the issue of um, low research funding and salaries for African faculty and their reliance on consultancies, which demand less um, transparency. Actually, publishing is discouraged among international off um, NGOs offering these consultancies. So faculty, um, regardless of where they did their PhDs, are therefore busy making a living with these consultancies rather than training their students. Sure. So then they continue the comment, um, probably if regional bodies such as the ARC can train faculty champions who can work closely with students in the universities, maybe we can work for um, or push for better working conditions for faculty themselves. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know, that, that's a comment rather than a question as the, as the person said, um, but, um, yeah, I, I know that for many folks in sub-Saharan Africa, the idea of remuneration is a tough one. Um, mm -hmm. And that teaching itself and trying to mentor students, that's not the most rewarded aspect of your job, whereas the publication and the consultancy are. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you have some comments there on like what these kinds of incentives are like um, for faculty in sub-Saharan Africa, as, as you've identified it. But um, I know that it's, it's a challenge in South Africa. It's a challenge um, throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. I'm just, I comment on South Africa because I know it for, as, as my own context. Yeah, sure. um, yeah. I, I think this is a great point. And I think, uh, as I mentioned, the issue of disinterestedness has a Metonian norm where uh, sparking a lot of great discussions uh, across the different training that I've done uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa a lot. That wasn't really happening a lot in Europe because as I said, even among the students, there are some of them that are really not uh, there because they like, like they're driven by the passion of research, just as you see people pursuing or having the, 
you know, the option of saying, I don't want to go into research. Most of them, they just further their education and they, they continue from the master to the PhD because they haven't really found any employment opportunity. So even at the, at, at, at the you know, I would say supervisor or professor level is also happening. Uh, as he mentioned, where most of the professor, instead of teaching, they don't really, they care less about, most of them, they care less about, you know, giving the teaching, but only about, I mean, it, it happens a lot, but at least they are, we, we, we couldn't just focus on people that are not doing the job the way they, they should be doing it, right? I think there are still quite a few of them that care about uh, quality research. Uh, I mean, I know in my home country, but also in the other country where I've trained, there are still some supervisor or professor that are receptive and that really want their student to do a great job. And these are the people that we should focus on, right? Like people that, are, that want to learn, uh, that people that still value uh, good ethical research, uh, quality research, reliable research that can uh, be reproduced, uh, that, that are reproducible, transparent and open. And I guess these are the people that we should focus on. Uh, and at least I want to, as much as possible, you know, emphasize on the fact that uh, the bottom-up approach is great, but it works more in European context or academic context where the student has the opportunity to challenge, at least to some extent, the supervisor. But in an African context, which come out a lot out of the different training that I've done, is very important to go for the top-down approach. I mean, at least train the next generation, but on top of that, uh, sensitize, you know, the, the, the elder generation that this is something that is important. This is becoming the norms. And you need to be able at least to share the data that you have, your raw data. This is something that is really not, there are a lot of people out there where people can, you know, you have a paper, but you, you don't even know to which, what's the data that was generated out of that. And it has been, you know, out there, it, it has been the tradition for quite some time, but now more and more um, uh, journals, reputable journal, or even less reputable journal are requiring those data to be shared. And this is something that they need to know. Openness, reproducibility is becoming the norms and they should follow. Like for me, I, I, I want to really like close it by saying like we shouldn't, Africa shouldn't, lag behind again like we should really we have the disposability to leapfrog yeah and and we shouldn't miss this opportunity it's there it's possible to do that there are open source software such as R. we can already start training the student from the start uh, the undergraduate student on how they can you know write have a code there's dynamic document out there this is the we, we shouldn't miss the train yeah yeah yes well, Elisa, I'd like to say thank you very much again. Um, I'd also like to thank Project Tier and again the funders of the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation for providing us to have this opportunity for this webcast series. Yeah, um, thank, you. thank you again. Okay, yeah. thank you so Excellent. much. Excellent. Okay, yeah. thank you. Bye.